Good evening. Today's topic, energy sources for skeletal muscles. We all know that muscles provide the power for movement of all sorts in the organism. This power has to come from somewhere. We all know that ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is that molecule. It's the most common molecule for energy. It is literally called the energy currency for cells. We know that the organelle mitochondria is where most ATP are produced. Not all, but most are produced. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to be looking at at least three different sources, three different sources of ATP and how these reactions uh, go through to release ATP for the use of energy, in particular in the myocyte, in the muscle cell. But this is not just unique only to muscles. All cells that require energy will get, get most of the energy from uh, ATP um, hydrolysis. And I'm going to explain or re-explain that hydrolysis part. Let's move on. The three different sources. First of all, um, well, before we look at the sources, let's see why ATP is required in, in the muscle uh, fiber in the myocyte. Number one, we studied about the ATP pumps that pumps the ions sodium and potassium in opposite direction in particular due to the fact that they are what we call leakage leakage channels leakage channels where these uh, ions leak down their concentration ingredients sodium leaks in potassium leaks out over time this leakage is going to offset the resting membrane potential and we don't want that we don't want our muscles contracting out of whack therefore the cells have this ATP which is a energy powered molecule protein pump that pumps the sodium and potassium against the ingredients in opposite direction to offset the leakage and to maintain resting membrane potential remember that so we need ATP to power those pumps then remember after myosin heads hydrolyzed the ATP to power the cocking of the head when the head binds to the active uh, sites and actin a power stroke follows ADP and PI falls off prior to the power stroke happening but then myosin heads remain attached to actin because it's now in a very low energy state to energize the detachment of the head from the actin binding sites a fresh new ATP molecule must bind to myosin head and at the same time reloads the head for another contractile cycle so we need ATP to detach the myosin head and to reload it, recock it then when all contraction has come to completion we cannot allow the, the calcium to be in high concentration in the sarcoplasm because that's going to just continue to initiate excitation, uh, in, initiate contractility. So we need to get the calcium out and how is that done? Energy is, is involved again. There are calcium pumps, active calcium pumps in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, in the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and these pumps require ATP to pull the calcium out of the sarcoplasm back into the stored region of the cell called the terminal cisterni, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So one, two, three specific application of ATP to drive these activities. Learn these, please. Now we're going to look at at least three sources. Three sources
three sources of ATP. The first one is this one, immediate cytosolic reaction. What is this? Now there's a, there's a compound. This is a, a naturally occurring compound in the cytosol. It's called creatine phosphate, and we're going to come on to the slide that talks about this. It's called creatine phosphate. You're going to see the correct spelling for it as we move on. It's a natural compound, as like I said. It's a high-energy compound, and um, it can very readily and easily, using an enzyme, can catalyze the release of uh, ATP for quick and immediate use. But it is not such a sustainable source because creatinine phosphate, creatine phosphate could um, only uh, sustain uh, tension on a muscle for a few seconds or a couple minutes, I guess, you know. You can read this slide to get the exact duration of time that your book say, but it's not very long at all, okay? Um, I think it's in seconds, 30 seconds, 30, 40 seconds, okay? The second one here is glycolytic catabolism. Remember catabolism comes from the word, it comes from the general word metabolism. Catabolism is that part of metabolism where you uh, take into account all of the breaking down chemical process. The breaking down chemical process comes under the head of heading of catabolism. So glycolytic catabolism is simply this. It's, you learn this in one on one. It's simply G L Y C O L Y S I S glycolysis. I normally say glycolysis, you know, purposely so you could hear that glyco meaning sugar, lysis, which means to lyse, the splitting of sugar. Glycolysis is basically splitting the six carbon sugar um, glucose into two three carbon molecules, two, three carbon molecules. Those are called either pyruvic acid or you can also say pyruvate. And the nice thing about this is that to do this, you need to pump in, you need to invest two ATPs. Two ATPs is required to split the sugar, glycolysis. And by the way, this happens in the cytosol. Glycolysis happens in the cyt in the cytosol, not in the mitochondria. Uh, so eight, two ATPs are required. However, when the bond is split in the middle of the uh, glucose, it goes through some steps which I'm not going to worry about right now. But it re it results in splitting glucose in two equal parts. Each of them is a pyruvate is a pyruvate molecule. When that split happens, guess what? Four ATP comes out. Because when you split the bond, you get energy. So four ATP is derived from glycolysis. At the end of glycolysis, four ATP is derived. However, because we invested two before, then our net gain is 2 ATP at the end of glycolytic catabolism. I tell you, it means the same as glycolysis. The third, oxidative catabolism. Pay attention to oxidative. This tells you that oxygen is involved. Oxygen is necessary. The other two are the other two are actually anaerobic processes. All right, this one and this one, these are all anaerobic processes. This one, the third one, however, the third one. It requires oxygen and must be done in the mitochondria. The two above, while they are extremely fast compared to oxidative catabolism, they're not very efficient because you only get like two molecules 
you know, from them. But they are immediate. So that's the advantage, quick. The third one, oxidative catabolism, takes a while because you have to go through all of that stuff. You gotta go through the Krebs cycle, two rungs of it, then you have to go through the electron transfer phosphorylation chain. But that one though more involved and slower is most productive. Average cells, 32 to 34, plus you get two outside of the mitochondria, so in all 36. Myocytes, however, produce more, 38 to 40 molecules of ATP per molecule of glucose that went into the aerobic respiratory pathway. Okay, so there you have it. The three different sources of ATP, and I would like you to remember these. I'll also like you to read up on the slides and get everything that the slide is saying. So we're going to look at some diagrams. What I've just told you now will be reiterated as we look at some figures that explains a little bit more. So let's go ahead. Okay, so let us see the correct spelling of that compound that I told you that is naturally occurring and you need to remember this compound can give up uh, two ATPs almost right away. Um, it's immediate and fast but not sustainable. Let's see. Come on, it says enough ATP for about just, I said 30 seconds a while ago. Man, I was wrong. I overestimated 10 seconds of maximum muscle activity. So these things are already made very quick, but so they die out very quick. They could only sustain for a very, very short period. Here's a little cartoon showing you the compound. It shows you how ATP is attached or stored inside of it. And by the catalysm, uh, the catalyzation using kinase, which is like an enzyme, it can quickly split off uh, to ATP from uh, creatine, leaving creatine behind and releasing uh, the ATP here. Okay. Guess I'll have to grab a pointer again here. So the second one, or glycolysis, as I told you, I've already shown you this, pyruvate. Um, this is what actually goes into the mitochondria and gets into the Krebs cycle. However, um, the first reaction that split uh, glucose into two pyruvic acid molecules, like pyruvate, um, actually yielded a net a net of two ATP. But check this one out. This is one is a little bit more sustainable than the creatine phosphate. This one can sustain for 30 to 40 seconds. 30 to 40 seconds of sustained contraction. Anything more than that, anything longer than that, you gotta switch to aerobic, you gotta switch to the products of aerobic respiration. Both, as I said, glycolysis and the other one, the creatine phosphate reaction are anaerobic um, oxygen not required, anaerobic activities. All right. However, once that pyruvate enters the mitochondria and goes through the Krebs cycle, we are talking about aerobic respiration. Here's the cartoon that brings out glycolytic, like the glycolytic um, catabolism. Glycolysis, glucose split. Um, in some cases, so this is pyruvate. If we use this thing for a source of energy, we give off lactic acid. If uh, yeast does it, they give off um, 
alcohol. However, notice that this pyruvate is outside of the mitochondria, but once it gets into the mitochondria, we are into oxidative catabolism. Oxidative catabolism, which means oxygen is required. This is a much longer process. The Krebs cycle is involved, the electron transfer phosphorylation cycle or chain is involved. Oxygen is an absolute necessity. Notice that in here, all food sources can be used as uh, original source, whether it is fatty acids, amino acids, um, or whether it's uh, pyruvic acid from glucose. So here we come to the long procedure, aerobic respiration or aerobic catabolism. Oxygen is required. Is required. Um, you got to go to the Krebs cycle. Um, just a quick reminder. There are some. Um, there are some. Excuse me. Let me get rid of this crap here. Um, there are some molecules that we call energy molecules like N like NAD plus which is in its uh, oxidative state and we have FAD that goes to NADH and F A D H two. So this happens when an electron is gained. Okay, when electron is gained, that's how you get this high energy state. So this is the reduced form. So the energy gotten from the sugar, from glucose, uh, is what is used to it's what is used to power. Let me get some like on point. See, the energy from the oxidative catabolism is what is used to reduce or make these oxidized uh, molecules reduce remember in the reduced state they are high in energy okay this these many of these are produced in the Krebs cycle when these get into the transfer phosphorylation chain they give up the electrons and it is the electrons that um, is involved in getting all those hydrogens across the mitochondrial membrane and eventually comes back in to drive an ATPase uh, gizimal that produces a bunch of ATP. You can go and revise that if you didn't get it clear in your one-on-one -on -one studies. But this is the long but most efficient. You get like uh, 36 ATP per glucose in a regular cell you could get 38 to 40 in myocytes remember myocytes have a bunch of mitochondria right okay moving on Let's get a pointer here. So oxidative catabolism, remember this this means the same as aerobic respiration. This means the same as aerobic respiration. Oxidative catabolism provides nearly 100 percent of the necessary ATP after several minutes. Okay. This system can provide ATP for hours once there is oxygen. 
So this is by far the most efficient and the most commonly used form of tissue respiration as far as providing ATP is concerned. So the muscles get most of it from here. The other two sources um, comes in very handy because they are very, very fast and immediate. So if there's a rush to get some ATP right away for very fast movement and very fast activities, they are there. The creatinine, the creatine phosphate and the glycolytic pathway, glycolytic oxidative, glycolytic, um, was the glycolytic pathway, right? Glycolysis is there to provide quick, quick um, sources of ATP, but not very much and not for very long. Okay, good. So you get it. the three sources, how muscles are energized, the role of ATP. Don't want to spend much more on the time here and this, so you can read this through. Just see here that myoglobin is like hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is in regular area. Myoglobin is the type of protein that carries oxygen in muscle. Remember, myoglobin is the specific protein that carries oxygen in muscles. Myoglobin is the oxygen carrying protein for myocytes. Okay, if we do anaerobic respiration in the case of glycolysis where we split and get some ATP, then one of the byproducts is lactic acid. You remember for yeast, when they did it, um, one of their byproducts was alcohol. For us, it is lactic acid, which needs to be removed um, afterwards because lactic acid buildup is not good either. So, you know, later on, after you have done this aerobic type of activity, the lactic acid has to be oxidized, and that's when you're going to use up the oxygen that you should have used. That is referred to as the oxygen debt. This book may call it something else, so look up for it. Oxygen debt, it simply means that you're going to have to oxidize this lactic acid that was built up from the gly glycolysis. And so glycolysis doesn't require oxygen, but the oxidation of the lactic acid that builds up requires oxygen. So it's like an oxygen debt. So you could check it out. Notice once you get into the mitochondria, you are into oxidative catabolism, oxygen is required, and the Krebs cycle and the electron transfer phosphorylation chain, all that activity goes on inside of the mitochondria. So let's talk, get some application here about this thing. There's a compound. Can creatine be found in drugstores, sports store? Of course it can. It's not cheap either. So sports people go, sports enthusiasts are going to buy their stuff because they figure, you know, if you get this, you're going to get ready-made ready -made, um, ATP to help you in your endurance in competition. What does your book say about it? It says that it is only mildly only mildly good at improving um, performance. <laughs> it's only mildly, and on top of that, there are some negatives. What are they? They cause good weight gain because it retain water, and if you take too much, it can damage your kidney. Plus, your body can't really store it. Your muscles can only use so much at one time, and all the rest of what you spend so much money on goes out in the bathroom it is ex excreted in urine all right so i don't know i leave it up to you if you think it worth it worth the risk and worth the money for the little bit of benefits you may get for it people still buy it people still use it i'm sorry folks i promise to just briefly talk about, about ATP hydrolysis. So I'm going to attach this slide to it. So let's go. We all know that ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, which means there are three phosphate groups, and that the first two groups, which is A, 
DP adenosine diphosphate as two phosphates, and then the third phosphate group acts like a lid that uh, kind of a traps the energy inside, so the energy is stored in there, so that uh, if this group breaks off, you know, the it goes to just the two phosphate group, which is ADP, that third phosphate group that is like a lid where the energy was stored in here, that energy comes out. The energy comes out to do work. So that, that's basically ATP hydrolysis. A, D, P, adenosine, five phosphate, that's two, D for di, and the PI right here, okay? These can actually go back together and you can reverse that arrow, we make back a full ATP molecule. So to write this out properly for you, I'm gonna go ahead and write it out properly for you. So it's A, T, P, through the process of hydrolysis goes to A, D, P plus a phosphate, normally written PI where the I stands for inorganic phosphate. So this is called ATP hydrolysis.